BlackRock's Evi Hambro co-manages the company's flagship world mining fund, as well as its $9 billion gold fund. Among its top holdings, Rio Tinto, BHP Billiton and Fresnillo. Both funds have consistently beaten the majority of their peers over the last five years, and the flagship world mining fund has more than doubled over the last 12 months. BlackRock's Evi Hambro joins me now. Evie, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Morning, Mark. Yeah, I'm just looking at the performance of your, your big fund, the World Mining Fund, a $17 billion fund. I mean, 2010 rose returns were 29%, 09, over 100%. Year to date, though, you're down about 4%, just slightly below the industry average. Um, do you think you can repeat at least 2010's performance? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had a crystal ball that could be that accurate, Mark. Um, no, it's a, I think we've had a, it's obviously been a tough start to this year. Um, the equity prices have underperformed the commodities, um, but uh, the profits that the companies are generating seem to be at record levels. And uh, with the companies returning part of that cash to investors via dividends and share buybacks and so on, and obviously M&A picking up as well. I don't think it'll be long before the shares start to generate some gains. Why do you think the equities are underperforming the, the commodities themselves? Well, I think there's a lot of uncertainty in the market right now. You know, obviously we had the news about uh, S&P in the US yesterday. There's been uncertainty around China and how far rates might uh, rise there, or what's going to happen to commodities demand. Um, we've also got uh, uncertainty about degrees of resource nationalism. You know, we've seen attempts by Australia last year to raise taxation uh, on the resources sector. George, George Osborne did it to the UK um, just recently. So I think there's uncertainty around what the governments are trying to do to company profits. And I think lastly, um, investors have been worried about what management teams are going to do with the profits they're generating. But you know, we're pleased to see the recent trend of returning that to investors. Uh, is, you know, it's very, very encouraging. Would you rather have money returned to you or would you rather that companies, I mean, you own shares in BHP, Rio Tinto, would you rather companies went out and made big acquisitions of which BHP Pillerton seems pretty intent on doing so? Yeah, and no, I think there's obviously a, a fine balance that these companies have to uh, have to tread here. So, you know, it's obviously very important to be reinvesting in your business, especially in the resources sector, where you know resource assets are finite in their nature. So you have to keep adding to your resource base over time. So I think that's a very important uh, goal for the companies. But I think in an environment where we are seeing asset prices, you know, at high levels. Um, we're also seeing commodity prices at high levels. Going out and doing M&A at, at such points for in some parts of the market can be more value destructive than uh, buying your own shares back. So we've been very pleased to see the, the majors embarking on this trend because you know, the largest, most liquid assets that you don't have to pay a premium for are your own shares. I'm going to put you on the spot, Evie. Uh, would BHP making an offer for Woodside Petroleum, would that be a good example of value destruction? Well, I think BHP have come out and uh, denied that. Um, they've come out and made comments that uh, confirms that the market is fully aware of what they're up to. So I think, uh, Mark, you're asking a question there that uh, the company said is unlikely to happen. But of course, this is a company that has been unsuccessful in its recent, recent uh, ambitions, such as Potash, such as Rio Tinto. I mean, is it time for Marius Kloppers just to, to hold pat, you know, return money to, to investors like yourselves, rather than chasing this big, big deal? Well, BHP have had a very good track record of uh, consistently paying dividends to their shareholders for, for many, many decades. Uh, they've also had a very good track record of returning cash via share buybacks. And, you know, and currently they're embarking on a very, very big one. You know, they've completed the Australian leg of it. They've still got about $3 billion or so to do of the London buyback. They're on track at the moment at current run rates to finish it by the midpoint of this year. If that's the case, you know, we would be hoping that they would embark on another share buyback plan. You touched on uh, the Standard & Poor's announcement yesterday, and that's uh, pushed more money, heavy into gold, which is nearing it on $1,500 an ounce. You were cited last year as saying that gold was reasserting itself as an alternate currency. I suppose that that statement uh, stands true today as well. I mean, simple question, Evie. I mean, you've got a lot of gold holdings. I mean, how high can gold go? I mean, 1,500. We've heard all sorts of predictions over recent years. Is this, is this rally just going on and on and on? Well, Mark, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I'm not going to give you a, a price level. 
Um, you know, we, we at BlackRock, uh, for our gold funds that we look after, we try and forecast uh, what the gold price is likely to trend over a three to five year period. And when you look at the underlying fundamentals in gold, they're all very supportive of, of today's pricing points and, and of pricing points higher than where we're trading right now. So we would expect to see this positive, ri gradually rising price trend in gold to continue for some years into the future. And I think some of the uncertainty that exists around exchange rates, um, quantitative easing, you know, what money, will, paper money will buy you in the future, all of that is only helping gold from a financial point of view. Yeah, and one of your colleagues, Catherine Raw, recently said that gold companies have to change their mentality, stop being lazy, stop resting on their laurels, and realize they've, they've got to perform. I, I'm sure that's a view that you, you hold dear to yourself uh, as well. Are you seeing evidence that this is happening? Will investors ignore gold companies and head towards, you know, exchange-traded funds? Yes, well, I think you're absolutely right there, Mark. You know, the, the single biggest competitor for gold equities today uh, is the gold physically backed gold ETFs uh, and there's a role for both in people's portfolios. The ideal way to get exposure to gold is via a mixture of both physical exposure, probably via the ETF if you can't find somewhere to store your gold bars or gold coins and gold shares because they provide you with the growth and the dividends and the thing that's been lacking in the gold equity space has been those growth and dividends. Now we're starting to see gold companies try and link their um, dividend prospects to the price of gold and I think that's going to be a major competitor advantage when it compares itself to the physically backed gold ETFs because at the end of the day gold bars don't produce little gold bars but gold mm. companies can pay dividends. What about commodities themselves? You've touched on gold, uh, EVI, I mean silver 31 year high, platinum 21 percent below its record, palladium off 35 percent. Does that tell us that those two commodities maybe are undervalued right now? Yeah, well, I think um, there are many people who trade charts and so on looking at the gold-silver ratio, gold-oil ratio and gold-platinum ratio. So if you look at it from that perspective, you'll see that platinum does look uh, very good value relative to the price of gold. But I, I, we're more fundamental in our analysis. We look at the individual case for each metal. And when you look at gold, we've already touched on it, the fundamentals are very supportive. Silver, we're seeing very strong industrial demand for silver, having replaced the, the photographic demand of the past. And investment demand remains strong. The question mark on silver is the very significant production growth we've come, got coming over the next few years, where some of the world's largest silver mines are starting, are going to come into production for the first time. Platinum remains supply constrained with many of the issues that the South African mining industry faces. Um, but with automotive demand being okay and, and China now becoming the largest automotive market, you know, I do think things are starting to look a little bit better there. Evie, thank you very much. We'll speak to you soon. Evie Hambro there you, from BlackRock.